Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm excited to be talking with you all about the teaching the first day of class. And next um, next week, classes start. So uh, this is a great time to think about some of the different things that you'll be doing in that first day of class. And Happy New Year, everyone. My name is Dr. Yvonne Johnson, and I work in the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning as the Multimodal Teaching Coordinator. I work with faculty and instructors and graduate assistants who teach face-to-face -face online, accelerated, hybrid, hybrid, all different types of course schedules and modalities. I also teach doctoral level research courses for the College of Health and Human Sciences, and I've taught a number of different educational technology courses and, and research courses. And so if, to get the community building started, if you could share your name and department, what you teach or what your role is at NIU, and then we can talk about um, some first day of class experiences as we go on. So if you would just share your name department and what you teach and your role at NIU in the chat, or if you want to engage your microphone, just raise your hand and you can share your intro that way as well. Either way is fine. Okay, great. So we have um, nursing instructor, um, Suze. Okay, great. Thank you for joining us, uh, Giselle. We have um, teaching courses, AHEC director, okay, and CHSS, okay. Um, math instructor, mainly methods for, methods for perspective, perspective teachers, okay, great. Um, Brandon, special and early education, great. Um, and Ken was for the prospective teachers. Okay, great. It's always nice to have a mix of different disciplines that we can construct knowledge together and learn and share insights with one another. That is a really strong benefit of, of our sessions. And okay, Morley, you said, um, Samantha, ESL education. Okay, great. Uh, Morley, you had your hand raised. Do you have a question? Uh, Samantha. Okay, and then INSOP works in allied health and communicative disorders, teaching me introduction of communication disorders and motor speech disorders. Um, awesome, great. And Helen. Um, Graduate Assistant in History, Teaching History um, 261, great. Okay, um, Suze, you had your hand raised. Did you want to share something or ask a question? It said what went well and challenges. I was just gonna share that, um, I don't remember if it was last year or the year before I did that um, whole school year long settled training to, um, for a ACU. Um, yes. And um, I used um, the, I did the syllabus scavenger hunt. Yes. And that went pretty well. And um, I think this time I might change it up and do the quiz where I get them to look at specific areas that I know they, even though we're going to go over it all, they're still going to forget about it. But yes. just to make more intention based to where they're going to be looking at key things, especially with grading. Um, because in nursing, my class is a core class. So an important thing they don't always understand is that you have to reach a 77% test average to first pass the class before I look at the uh, like the quiz grades yes. and that kind of thing. So yes. that's something I really want to, you know, pull out to them. And I think doing it as a quiz might 
be a little bit better than the scavenger hunt aspect. But um, yeah. I found that um, training to be very helpful. I've used several things in it. That's great. Great. Thank you for sharing that. And, and yes, your point about having some intentional activities related to the syllabus is, is excellent. And it does, it incentivizes them and to, you know, dig into that syllabus and you have um, intentional questions that direct them towards those parts of the syllabus that they might not catch if they're kind of just skimming it. And so that's terrific. Thank you for sharing that and, um, and for doing that. That's terrific. And then looking at, um, yes, and Ken's talking about challenges going over the syllabus. And um, okay, and then Deborah joined and teaches um, group therapy, clinical perspectives for family social services, systemic sex therapy. Okay, great. Thank you for joining us and for sharing your introduction, Deborah. Okay, thank you. And so in terms of the first day of class, um, does anyone want to share a favorite first day of class story, something that just kind of jumps to, to your mind about um, a positive first day of class situation that occurred? I got positive responses with using just doing the scavenger hunt. That's terrific. Yes. And it is true. Um, the scavenger hunt, my daughter was an undergrad um, a few years ago. And so, you know, being the educator, I was asking her about her first, you know, week in class and things like that. And, and she was talking about a, a scavenger hunt for a um, syllabus for a course. And so I started asking her questions about that. And initially she was kind of, you know, not quite sure about that activity. But then after I asked her questions, she said, you know what? She said, I really do have a clear understanding of what the expectations are, the key parts of the course, you know, things that are gonna help me be successful. Um, so I'm, I'm so happy to hear that you got those, that positive feedback about that. Um, because initially people might think that it's not really that impactful of an activity, but it really, really is. And you as the instructor can design it to address those parts of the syllabus that you know are really going to be impactful for the students and that they tend to maybe miss if they're just skimming over. So that's great. Thank you for sharing that. And um, I taught this weekend in a face-to-face -face weekend, and I was talking to the students, and one of the things they said was that they really appreciated the, the design and structure of the course, that there was this plan for the entire course and that there was a rhythm and sequence to the course and that it helped them to feel more calm and, and confident about what they were gonna be doing for the next 16 weeks. So that was a, a recent positive um, first day of class story. Okay, thank you for sharing that. And today we're gonna to be talking about planning and being prepared for the first day of class and building connections and community and the importance of that, engaging the students in active learning in the first day, and then handling logistics and resources and expectations. And thinking about those first day of class guidelines, you definitely want to plan it. And, you know, we might think, well, you know, we've taught so many years and we don't really need to plan. We can kind of just go in and talk. But it really is important to be intentional about that first day of class to get that. Because um, this is the first connection that you have with the students. Um, have some pre-course emails and things. But 
that first day of class is, is really impactful. So you want to have positive first impressions. Get the students involved quickly. I always have, like, right away some kind of activity. And one of the reasons for that is because I want to make sure that the students know they are going to be actively engaged. And also, to respect the time, um, some students are very um, conscientious and, and they come early to class so they're on time and some um, are, are not as, uh, they don't come necessarily right on time and things like that. And so I want to make sure that the students know that, you know, we are going to be using the, the class period and respect the time of the people who really got there um, and are ready to learn and things like that. And so we want to give them value and we want them to realize that there's a reason to come to the class and clarifying those learning objectives and course expectations and creating that rapport um, and connections in a safe learning environment that is inclusive and values everyone that's really, really important. And students will be more engaged if they feel like they understand the learning objectives, the the value of them, the expectations that their voices are valued and that it's a safe learning environment um, and help students to learn the, understand the learning process and the way that you have designed the course. It's important to explain that to students so they know what to expect. And the particular course that I started teaching this past weekend is, it's a scaffolded course where there's a, some very large projects due at the end, but as we, but they're broken into several key chunks of, of work. And so those chunks of work and those modules build up to the major assignments, the, the final assignments in the course. And so explaining this to the students how those learning objectives and those assignments all fit together, helps them to understand the learning process and how it's all gonna move through the, the semester. And, and they appreciate that. Um, and so then since they understand that process and it's planned very clearly, then they kind of relax and they can focus on, on the learning. They're not questioning um, how does this all fit together? You explain the logistics to them, the cadence. Maybe you have um, discussions that are due. Um, for instance, my discussions, the initial posts are due on Thursdays, and then the final posts are due on Sundays. And so there's a cadence and logistical pattern, and they get familiar with that. And so then they can build that into their calendars and feel comfortable with that. And you want to introduce the subject matter and have some pre-class warm-ups. And this is not a Blackboard session, but, but I do want to point out that when working with the, um, your Blackboard course, you know, there's a process. You request a new course in Blackboard. You, um, and now we're only using Blackboard Ultra Course View. You can get a template. Um, access where you can design, well, the, the standard structure is, is um, created and then you can fill in the, the specific work for your course and you can add images to your profile and customize it. And um, so you can go to the CIDL site and it will provide you tips for starting off semester and how to do your Blackboard work. And then whether you're teaching face-to-face -face or online or some kind of mix, you want to always have introductions. And fortunately, when we use Blackboard, we can have um, persistent material in our courses. And so that supports the needs of different learners. Maybe they caught the introductions if you had them synchronous or asynchronous or um, but they can go back and they can 
look at this persistent information again. So um, I would encourage you to have those introductions of the instructor and students and clearly this define the goals and objectives and have that big picture description of the course. And it's also useful to explain to the students how the course they're taking fits into the larger curriculum. Is it a core course? Is it a course that is a prerequisite for something? Is it um, related to a specific topic that's an elective? So explain how your course fits into the larger curriculum. Explain your um, expectations, creating the class norms, and you can have students engage in contributing to building those class norms, and that helps to <clears throat> show them that their input is valued, and then they're more likely to be engaged and active learners if they see that their contributions have an impact on the course and are valued. And then icebreakers are also an important way that you can get students comfortable talking and engaging with the material, with you, with their colleagues. And when you do that at the very beginning of the course and continue to do it, then they become more comfortable. But if, if you have several sessions of the course and then start to get them engaged, then they've already established they think, well, okay, this is going to be, I'm not going to be as engaged in the course because I haven't been engaged from the very beginning. So you want to start those engagement activities the very beginning of the course on that first day. And we talked about that scavenger hunt for the syllabus. And, um, you know, there's different ways to do that. You could have them um, do it individually, small groups, pairs. Um, it's different ways to do it, but the idea is that they're familiarizing themselves with the syllabus and they are aware of those key expectations for the course and they've engaged with it. So it's not as if there was just a discussion. They actually were actively engaged with the syllabus and it's much more impactful. And we also talked a little bit earlier about how there might be, you might use a quiz, but there are different ways to engage with the syllabus. Um, and they're more impactful than just having them, having a broad discussion or, or having them skim over it. And thank you for sharing that feedback on that syllabus scavenger hunt and quiz. I appreciate that. And to show the, that you are, creating a safe environment, an inclusive environment, um, an environment where you want each student to engage. You can use, um, if you're meeting face-to-face, -face, you can use name tensor. Um, you can have them fill out their Blackboard profile and add a picture if they want to do that. Um, use different techniques to learn their names. Um, ask them to write something about themselves. Ask them to introduce each other. I often do that in the class. Have them introduce. Yes, I will, Samantha. I will be sharing the slides. Thank you for asking that. I will. After the event, I will send the slides to people. So these different techniques for getting them to share their information, asking them if they want to share their pronouns, you share your pronouns. This helps the students to know that you are interested in them, that they are as individuals valued in the learning environment. And curiosity is a really, really big part of, of learning. And we know from research that if we can spark the curiosity of students and get them excited about the topic, that it really is much more impactful than if they're kind of just 
if then if they're not really excited about the material. So if you can do something or have them think about what is really exciting to them about the topic. And one of the things I teach is research and I always try to get them to think about different topics they've researched. And everybody has researched something, even if they think they haven't, they have. Um, but if you can connect, help them connect the material, the content of your course to something that they really get excited about, then that's gonna have a powerful impact um, from that first day and throughout the semester. And logistics are really important. Um, we wanna make sure that that's clear so that there's no confusion and then the students can focus on learning and not being confused about the logistics of the course. So you sharing your, you know, the office hours, how you're going to engage with them, whether it's virtual, face-to-face, -face, which do you use Teams, collaborate, Zoom, whatever. The materials that the students are gonna need, the assignments, the grades, all of those policies and things have that clearly established and have it available in Blackboard so that, you know, you have a discussion about it, but they can always go back and look. And then they are clear about that and they can focus on learning. They don't have to, to um, use a lot of bandwidth trying to figure out the logistics. And you can have orientation modules and the structure of your course is really important. And that's where that template from CIDL comes in. If you email the CIDL team, then you can ask to be put on this template list, and then you can copy this template. And it will be similar to what you see on the screen there. There will be folders, and there will be documents within the folders. And then you have those modules set up and the students get used to it. The students get familiar with the way that these courses are set up and it's clear to them. They know where to go to get the information. They know where to go to submit their assignments. They know how to navigate the course. And that provides a lot of strong foundation so that again, they can focus on learning the course and engaging with you, the content, and the other students, rather than spending so much time trying to figure out just the course and how to navigate it. We want that to be seamless for them, and CIDL has a process for that, so you can get that template, and then you can build it yourself. And then the learning and expectations. So from that first day of class, you know, have the students try a task. Um, before they're ready. Now, this is something that you could, um, for instance, I have students practice some some interviewing techniques. And so there, I tell them, okay, this is a, a learning environment. You're practicing this um, and you want to practice it and refine these techniques before you actually need to go out and collect the data in the field. And so um, you've built that comfortable, supportive, inclusive learning environment, and then you're having them practice and encourage them. And ask them, you know, what techniques support their learning the best? And if students have a bit of time to think about it, they can think about, well, you know, if I think about a course that really worked well for me, what was it about that course, about the approach to that course that really supported their learning? And they'll say, well, maybe it was that they got to practice. Maybe they got to practice the techniques, or maybe it was that the information was shared ahead of time, or that they got to work with groups or different things. But if you ask students to think about it, then they'll reflect on what was a positive learning experience for them. And then you can make sure that you're weaving in those different approaches when you're teaching and use those active learning techniques because we have extensive research that shows that active learning supports their learning at deeper levels. 
So let's say they've spent time, you've talked about the different um, content, you've had some examples, you've had them discuss it, you've had them actively engage with it and then reflect. When you use those different techniques and use those from the very beginning of, of the course, research shows that the students will learn at a deeper level and they'll be able to retain the information longer and retrieve it. Retrieval is also connected with practicing retrieving it, but if you have them engage with the material, in a variety of ways and actively um, engage with it and then reflect upon it and retrieve it. It's much more effective in terms of their long-term learning and retrieval. And establishing the relevance of the course and expectations is, is important when the students see that the content is relevant to them and it's going to be useful to them in for their other courses, for their future degree um, activities, for their profession, for their personal life, then they're much more likely to be engaged with it and to connect from that first day of class on. So um, you might send out a survey the first day of class or um, early in the semester and find out what their interests are. For instance, I meet with the students, with every student in the first couple of weeks of class to find out what their specific interests and needs are so that they know, you know, I'm here to support your learning to help you to get the most out of the class and to make the content help you make the content as relevant and um, applicable to your needs as possible. And so we talked about, so um, using announcements is really important in terms of connecting with students, setting up that, the expectations for the course and having regular announcements to stay connected with the students. Aligning everything is very important in terms of your learning objectives for the course, your content, your assessments, all of that needs to be clearly connected. And I explain to the students how the different activities and assessments connect with the learning objectives of the course and how these are um, important and relevant to them. And I also ask them to discover why this particular activity is relevant to them because that's really powerful when a student can discover for themselves why the activities are relevant to them as opposed to having an external um, factor such as an instructor tell them why it's relevant um, or sometimes their other students can share relevance but self-reflection is a very powerful tool also in terms of getting them to do that from the first day of class and beyond. And we talked about sharing the expectations on Blackboard. The persistence of the information in Blackboard is important because you share a lot at the beginning of the semester, you know, the first day of class and, and the, the modules and everything. There's, there's a lot and it can, you know, sometimes they can miss some of those details, but the fact that that information is persistent in Blackboard Blackboard allows for them to go back and look at it and refresh their um, refresh their information and memories about it. And then they, if they have questions about it, they can keep going back to it. So um, you're more likely to have that engagement from the first day of class and beyond. And some of the things that you can do is have some non-graded assessments, maybe simple formative assessments during your synchronous sessions, whether they're face-to-face -face or, or online or hybrid, you can have some kind of simple non-graded assessments just to kind of gauge where they are. If you start doing this the first day of class, like I said, you want to start these activities, these techniques, the first day of class so that, you know, they're not settled into some kind of rhythm and then you throw in some unique technique 
six weeks down the road. That, that's not going to be um, nearly as successful. Provide research resources for additional review, set clear expectations, and to address the needs of different levels um, of students who have different levels of knowledge about the topic, I will include different folders in Blackboard that maybe have more foundational information if some of the students, you know, I did a survey to kind of gauge their entry level knowledge about the course. Then for that first day, first week of class, I'll have some resources, some maybe some foundational resources for those students that don't necessarily have that strong a foundation when they're coming in. Or I'll also have a folder for students to maybe challenge them if they have a fairly strong foundation, they're kind of more advanced coming into the course. And then that's going to help the students to see that their individual needs are going to be met. And then again, those clear expectations you post in Blackboard and discuss with them. And you can have open discussions for questions and answers. That's easy to do in Blackboard. And then building community. That is really, really important in terms of getting the students to engage with each other and one of the things that you can do is to humanize yourself to the students. And you can, you can share something about yourself. Maybe why is this topic so interesting to you? Why are you so excited about this topic? Something maybe that you like to do. For instance, I might share that I like to, to kayak. One of the reasons I really love research is X, Y, Z. Outside of class, I like to kayak and do these different things. And it helps to humanize yourself, breaks down some of those barriers that students might have if they're uncomfortable connecting with the, with the professor. If possible, greet each student and, um, you know, greet them by name, get those individual conversations going with students or you can group chat with small groups of them with the whole group of them and set a positive inclusive and culturally responsive tone and one of the things that i do is always have students share i'll have just a quick share you know something positive that happened to you related to your education um since the school year started or you know and they'll say well you know um, you know, I was really afraid to start this course because I thought that I didn't have any knowledge of it and I was really afraid it would be hard. And now I see how it's laid out and I feel comfortable. They feel more comfortable getting into the class. So if you have them share something positive, then I always have it focus on positive because, you know, it's going to help them to see, oh, yeah, you know, or they put a lot of work into this particular course that was hard and they had a, you know, their grade improved. And so they realize from that quick reflection that, yes, you know, maybe I struggled, but but my grade improved. So that was a positive thing. And it it changes that tone and puts it on a, a positive note. And that's a better environment for learning than if you're starting on a uh, not as positive note. And when you're including resources in your course, make sure that they represent the diversity of our students and, and wide ranges of backgrounds and different perspectives. And reflection activities are really important. Um, and when I was talking to my students this, this weekend, they were talking about how they really valued the other students sharing their perspectives and they saw that you know other students were having the same types of um they they share perspectives from different from different backgrounds and they they were supportive of each other and um the students said that they liked and learned from these different perspectives and that they valued them 
And so those reflection engagement activities really do go a long way in terms of, of building that community. And then um, one of the things that you could do is include an introduction welcome message in Blackboard. I'm sure that, um, you know, that's very common. And you can include the learning objectives, how to get started, accessibility. Um, a lot of this information is in that template that you can get from CIDL if you send an email to CIDL. You can create an introduction video that you can post in Blackboard. And that, again, is persistent information. And so when the students go into Blackboard, it comes alive because they see. They see you. They hear you. They hear what's important about the course. They hear what you, um, you know, why you're excited about the content. They hear what you like to do outside of class. And so it, it goes a long way in terms of building that learning community and humanizing the the environment. And you can have an instructor page that has um, a text description as well. So with with multimedia, it's you're very fortunate. You can include pictures, video, audio, text. It's it's wonderful to really bring your Blackboard course alive. And weekly greetings are a really nice way to start off each week. So you start off that the first week with, well, there's an overall introduction to the course. And then with each week, you can have a weekly greeting, just a short video that highlights what's going to happen this week. You know, what's the focus of the week? What is, um, what are the assignments that are going to be due? Maybe something, something fun that's happening that week. One of the things we can also do in um, Blackboard and then with these connection videos is share an event that's happening at NIU and maybe the students want to engage with that. And so that builds them connections with the larger NIU community as well. And, and they get excited about that because sometimes students don't have the time to explore the NIU calendar um, as much. So if there's some big event like homecoming week is an, an easy one where you can share things that are happening or when mission the the um, NIU mascot dog is going to be around campus. That's a fun thing to to share during finals week. They can go to the library and spend time with mission. So you can add these little things into your weekly greetings and it brings the course alive and keeps them engaged. Um, OK, so let's see. So Giselle, you wanted to go back to this slide. Which slide did you want to go back to? That one? OK. OK, you're welcome. And I will share these slides so you will have that, OK? So you can, for the introduction, you can put the course learning objectives and then get started. This is kind of a introduction to the course and then you can have accessibility statements um, but this is just one small part of it but if you request that template from CITL by um, emailing CITL CITL at NIU.edu then you can ask to be put on that um, Blackboard template list and then you can import this template into your course and then you can fill out the the structure. So does that help? OK, you're welcome. OK, and we talked about including a video and an instructor page, add something about why you're excited about, about the course. And be sure to include in there, you know, how the students can contact you. What's the best way to contact you? Is it through email? How, how would you like to meet with them? Are you going to be available virtually? Are there any times that they could physically meet with you? Different things. And, and so if you share that openness 
um, and encourage them to connect with you and ask questions, then they won't wait, you know, hopefully they won't wait until they have some really, get really confused that they'll ask you questions early. Um, so you can, you can open up that line of communication in your video in your instructor page. And the weekly greetings definitely support that, kind of focus them on what's important for that week and keep that humanization and that engagement of you and the students. And there's um, different ways that you could have introductions online. You might use a, a flip, it used to be called Flipgrid, but now it's called Flip. It's a simple tool where students can record a short video and then I'll have them respond to each other. And so those introductions and responses are persistent in this flip um, system. And, you know, it's audio, video. And so it, it makes it more feel more like, um, you know, they just feel more connected because they can hear and they can see and they can um, talk to each other about different content or introductions like that. That's a simple way to do virtual introductions. Okay, so in terms of reflections, on the techniques that we talked about today. We talked about different ways that you could create community in the class. What are different techniques? Does anyone want to share a technique that they've used to build community in their class? I have more, I think, community feel in the room that I teach that has tables where several people are sitting at a table okay. as opposed to sitting in desks. Um, I think the tables make it easier for group work as well as opposed to sitting at the desk. Um, I do try to really emphasize that, um, you know, I talk about there's different types of families and this is their nursing family and they're going to be a family for the next you know five semesters so they really need to be able to rely on each other um, to get through so i try to build that sense of community at the beginning and just stress how important it is to not just get to know each other so you can have a network to help get through um, a nursing program, but also to have the, um, you know, with other members outside of first track so they could talk to people and form connections with other tracks because they can also be a source of support um, for questions they have to help them get through the program. Yes, thank you. Those are excellent ideas and techniques. And the point you raise about the way that the the way that the furniture is situated in a room is that's a really important point. And so if you have, like you said, tables, then and if they're movable or not, sometimes they're affixed and sometimes they're not. And so think about different engagement techniques you can use based upon the even the furniture in the room that's a really important point um, because if if it's more like the chairs the desks are all faced in sort of like that traditional lecture hall and they're affixed and not then you have to use different approaches to get them to connect and um so that's that's a really important point and the other thing you were talking about in terms of the the people, the students in the different tracks and how the students are 
so it it's so important to stay connected and build those relationships with students because you support each other and they have this that shared experience of being in the program and having exposure to all of this complicated um, content and how you know each student has their unique way of being successful and some of the tracks that have gone before them can share insights so those those are exceptional um, ideas and I remember um, many years ago when I was working on my um, dissertation one of my cohort members was she was really struggling with something and I was I said well what is it you know and she said oh it's this or that or whatever I said you know what I have a I have something on that you know and I can get it to you today and she said oh my gosh you know I've been searching for this you know for like eight months and so that's really important that they they realize the value of the colleagues that are students in their in their program that's awesome yep thank you and then so looking at the think pair share yes and think pair share so deborah's talking about think pair share and you can do think pair share even if you're in a lecture hall and this the tables are the chairs are fixed and they all face forward you can still do think pair share even in a situation like that and that really does provide students the um opportunity they get some time to reflect because to think and that's really important because some students need that reflection time they need that moment to think and then feel comfortable talking to their partner and then sharing with the larger group and that is definitely something that can help to um to build those connections build that engagement deepen their levels of learning and then Ken is talking about most of the students know each other, but you get them in small groups, do an introduction activity within the group and then share. Yes, and when you mix them up with each other in these small groups, they learn other things. For instance, I'll give them a few open-ended prompts and they'll learn things about students that they didn't know about each other. We actually just did that this weekend. And so they can always continue to learn and those small groups um, can construct some knowledge and then they share it with the whole class. So, so that's a great technique. And then uh, Samantha's talking about liking the online persistent information. Yes, yes, and the mock tasks. And it is true, and I talked about um, that this weekend in terms of, okay, you're gonna practice all of these techniques, many, many techniques in this course. And it's kind of like I give them an example. It's like when you were learning how to walk. I mean, you know, you get up and you fall and you, you know, you toddle and you fall and then pretty soon you're running. And that's the way learning is. It's, you know, we're all seasoned uh, scholars, you know. I mean, we have years and years of experience and, but need to know, the students need to realize that you know, learning involves trials and tribulations and stumbles and, and then growth. And so um, embracing that and normalizing that is um, something that's important. So they don't feel like they're making a mistake because um, part of learning is you don't know, otherwise why would they be in the course? And then INSOP is talking about using reflections, yes. And then the students can mingle together with the activities, yes. And then um, Deborah's talking about allowing students to share their expectations. And what you'll find is very interesting because students have very high expectations for norms in the course. They might set higher expectations and more um, than, than you might expect. It's really interesting kind of see that evolve. And then Ken's talking about a PLC for the semester, yes. Uh, professional learning communities are um, an incredible way to to build that community. And then Zach's talking about allowing opportunities for students to get to know and develop relationships with classmates. And so, and Zach, the wonderful thing about that is these relationships, they will persist. You will have some close relationships that persist far beyond the course at this semester, you know, and, and that's really a strength of 
education and building that community. And then Ken's talking about um, maybe going back to a social emotional question starting the class. Um, describe yourself in two cartoon characters. And that's really interesting. We had um, Dr. Sarah Kavanaugh, um, a couple of years ago, she, she came to our Teaching Effectiveness Institute, which, by the way, is this Thursday. Um, if anyone wants to register, there's a Teaching Effectiveness Institute. Um, yes, go ahead, Ken. I see you have your hand raised. I was just going to describe what that is, and it's not my idea. I got the idea from teaching with, uh, I can't think of her, uh, I can only remember her first name right now, Rachel. I'll remember it sooner or later in uh, ILAS 201. And okay. she started the classes like this. And so it's like describe two cartoon characters, or if you have like, a, if you can get some technology or a superpower, what would you like to have? Those kinds of That's introspection awesome. questions. And I always do a midterm meme. So the student gets to, I do a share. Uh, PowerPoint and they get to post one or two memes and they can do it without their names. That's fine about mm -hmm. how they feel about the semester, about the class, or my students are also in clinical teaching at least mm -hmm. one day a week at the time. So it's like interesting how they, what, what's common amongst them. And then also what's yes. different when they post that stuff gets them thinking yes. about this is not just class, 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 class kind of things. Mm hmm. Yeah, so, that's excellent. That's an excellent example. Rachel and like Warren. you said, yeah, that, <laughs> oh, yes, Rachel, Rachel Warren. Warren. Uh -huh. Yeah. I know I'd remember. Yeah, I was, when you said it, I was like, I know her. <laughs> yeah, that's a great example. Um, and we had, um, like I said, Sarah Cavanaugh, she's done extensive research on connection between emotion and learning and how that really like I had that slide a couple of slides earlier with the curiosity and the two little boys with their just all lit up you know if you can really get them connected on some social emotional level it really um it really solidifies that learning a lot so that's a great example thank you okay so um I appreciate all of you talking about your experiences and your time today. And is there anything else that someone wants to add before we um, close out for today? Okay, thank you. Okay, so let me get the link for the Teaching Effectiveness Institute because we, um, um, it is Thursday, so if, I think you can still register today. It's online, um, and we're going to be talking about equity, um, grading for equity. So let me put that in the, um, the link in the chat if anybody wants to register. Um, okay, so just to summarize, um, you know, have a plan, be prepared, keep building those connections and community and get them engaged from the beginning and clearly have the logistics and expectations um, set out and that persistent information. And you can contact um, the CIDL team. We have lots and lots of, of resources. If you want to get that CIDL template, you can um, email CIDL at NIU.edu and ask for that Blackboard template, and they'll put you on a list, and then you can um, copy that in your course and then just keep copying it to create your um, structure. Um, and you can contact us for different um, support as well. So thank you all very much. And I hope that you all have a great 2024. Go Huskies. <laughs>